to our second grand rounds of the year here in the Biomedical Informatics and Data Science Program uh, for the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Paul Nagy, and it's really my pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker today. Uh, Dr. Patrick Ryan is the Vice President of Observational Health Data Analytics at Janssen Research and Development, where he leads a team of 20 scientists to develop and apply analysis methods to better understand the real-world effects of medical products. He is also an assistant adjunct professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. He has over 200 publications in the field of observational research with over 37 so far in 2021. Uh, Patrick is, is a founder of the Observational Health Data Science and Informatics Community. This is pronounced Odyssey. Odyssey is an open science interdisciplinary collaborative to develop open source solutions that create evidence from observational health data through large scale analytics. The Odyssey community has invented how to conduct reproducible medical observational research through the use of computational phenotypes. Uh, Patrick served as a principal investigator of the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, uh, pronounced OMOP, which is the data model used in the Odyssey community, which was a public-private partnership chaired by the Food and Drug Administration, where he led methodological research to assess the appropriate use of observational healthcare data to identify and evaluate drug safety issues. Uh, Patrick received his undergraduate degree in computer science and operations research at Cornell University and his master's of engineering and operations research and, and industrial engineering there as well, and received his PhD in pharmaceutical outcomes and policy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, where Pat and Patrick has worked in various positions within the pharmaceutical industry at Pfizer, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, and at Janssen. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Paul. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here, really excited about what you all are doing. Uh, in at Johns Hopkins and excited to share a little bit of the work that we're doing in the Odyssey community that can hopefully uh, continue the journey together. Should I just jump in? Yes, please. All right, great. So um, first, let me just start with a disclosure. So as Paul mentioned, I'm an employee of Janssen R&D, shareholder of Johnson & Johnson. I'm not going to talk about any of the medical products that were involved in our portfolio as part of this talk, uh, but want to share that disclosure to get on with. Our objectives for today, uh, particularly as it relates to the, the overarching goals we have here, um, we're going to talk today about evaluating the quality of real-world evidence in the context of randomized clinical trials. We're going to talk about how we can demonstrate how real-world evidence can be generated at scale to fill evidence gaps in healthcare. And, and I'd also like to, to hopefully use this as an extended invitation to, to discuss how Odyssey as a community and as an international data network uh, can be used by all of you at Johns Hopkins to advance the science that you all are leading. Um, so I'm gonna hopefully uh, make sure to touch on these points and I'm gonna do it through uh, a little bit of a, a discussion and narrative about what Odyssey has been doing, uh, including one of the showcase uh, methodologic experiments we've conducted in Odyssey called Legend. So, uh, I think Paul's done a good job of evangelizing Odyssey within your broader community. Uh, a couple of big things to just highlight. This is an open science community. This is your extended open invitation. If you're not yet part of Odyssey, please come join us. We're looking for researchers uh, uh, around the world to participate in being part of this open science effort to, to generate evidence. Basic approach is we need data, we need good high quality analytics, and we wanna generate evidence and get it in the hands of patients and providers around the world that need answers to important questions. And we've got a lot of researchers around the world, a lot of databases, but ultimately we're still sitting here waiting for evidence of reliable questions. And that's why we need, that's why we continue to need to grow this community. It's important that I state what Odyssey's mission is because it's gonna be central to the theme of what we're talking about here. Uh, our goal is to improve health by empowering a community to collaboratively generate evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care. Uh, and as you are building your own local community within Johns Hopkins, I, I hope that you also see the opportunities to be part of this broader international community but that we have a shared goal in mind, which is how do we actually use data to generate evidence and then get that evidence in the hands of decision makers so that better care can, can happen. The broad strokes of how Odyssey works, we work through collaborations. Those are collaborations in open community data standards, open source software development, methodologic research, and clinical evidence generation. We 
uh, currently have the world's largest international data network. What it means for us to have a distributed data network is that data partners, organizations who have access to patient level data have decided to transform their data into the same open data standards that I highlighted, and also to adopt open source standardized analytic tools uh, that can be used to generate evidence. And so that's how these collaborations are actually feeding in here. As a distributed data network, we are not centralizing data into any one common repository. Um, but rather organizations can, can hold their data securely within their own firewall. And we now have over 300 databases around the world that are kind of adhering to this general practice. What Odyssey also does is we conduct network studies. And by network studies, what we mean is a pre-specified protocol in a full, fully specified analysis plan that can be shared with data partners, passed through that firewall securely, where we ask the questions of data sets and what we're returned back is not data, but answers to questions. And that comes in the form of aggregate summary statistics, which can be compiled across one or more data sources. And then as a community, we collaboratively interpret those aggregate summary statistics to determine the insights we've gained from those results. And then we develop the appropriate strategies to disseminate. So in terms of our objective three for this grand rounds, how can Johns Hopkins get involved? Well, um, you guys could be here. You can help. And some of you are already helping drive some of these open community data standards. You could be here. You could help with the development of uh, software in the, the both in terms of uh, identifying the needs and specifications, contributing to the code and the development and the testing of that and the deployment within institutions. You could be here helping us with methodologic research, helping us start to advance scientific best practices in the field of analysis of these data. You can be over here as a data partner as part of this distributed network, whereby you can benefit from tools and running analyses locally to answer questions within your own firewall. Or you can be over here contributing as a intellectual thought leader and data partner through these Odyssey network studies. All of these are opportunities available to all of you on this call. Several of you on this call I see have, have already taken that call to action and are actively participating. But really, I, if I look at Johns Hopkins as, a, as an institute, you guys are uh, uh, leaders in field in many of these different do domains, and we'd really welcome your, your contributions and participation along this suite. Uh, so um, when I stated the mission, I stated that our goal is to generate evidence. Um, and when one word that's not actually explicit in our mission quite yet, quite, quite yet is the notion that that evidence needs to be reliable. And in science right now, there's a lot of discussions about what actually makes for reliable evidence. Uh, and so what I'm gonna talk about during this Grand Rounds presentation is, is our journey to think about generating evidence from this large data network, um, but also being able to quantify how reliable that evidence is uh, and hopefully get to the point where it, we think it's of sufficient reliability that we believe that it's evidence that really should inform uh, health, health decisions and, and, and patient care. When we think about evidence reliability, I, I'm going to be talking about the use of observational data, administrative claims, electronic health record data. Um, and a lot of my work wearing my J&J &J hat is oftentimes trying to do work that would be considered regulatory science. So generating evidence to support interactions between my employer at J&J &J, and regulatory agencies such as the FDA and the EMA. And when the FDA comes talking about what reliable evidence is, they most commonly are talking about the standards and guidances that they've provided for evidence at large, which implicitly draws from most of its framework um, from the maturity that's happened in randomized clinical trials. But to be very clear, when the FDA, in their guidance for our clinical evidence, when they state what is required of evidence, to be considered regulatory grade to be submitted. They don't say it must be a randomized clinical trial. Actually, what they state is that evidence needs to be consisting of adequate and well-controlled investigations, uh, including clinical investigations by experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate the effectiveness of drugs involved, 
on the basis of which could be fairly and responsibly be concluded by such experts that the drug has an effect it purports or is represented under the conditions used prescribed, et cetera, et cetera. Revision to these guidelines from the FDA stated that um, data from one adequate and well-controlled clinical investigation and confirmatory evidence obtained prior to or after such a gesture can be sufficient to establish effectiveness. Now, I'm, I'm highlighting this as a backdrop because many people would will say at broad starts like the only way to produce reliable evidence is randomized clinical trials. Um, and what I'm going to actually assert is my premise here is the only way to generate reliable evidence is to generate evidence and prove that it's reliable. And whether the proof of that is through the demonstration of, of well-controlled studies through randomization, or it's through a disciplined approach of conducting observational analysis, the goal is still the same, evidence that's reliable, reliable enough to be trustworthy. What's also actually implicit in these, in these guideline statements, though, is this, this idea of adequate and well-controlled investigations, where investigations is plural, because the recognition is one element of making evidence reliable is the fact that you have confirmatory evidence, that is, two or more sources of information telling you a consistent story. And indeed, part of the reason in Odyssey we think of the need for network-based research across many different databases is because one one strategy for generating reliable evidence is going to be that we're not just doing one random experiment on one random data set, but rather we're actually thinking about a disciplined approach to analyzing sets of data, networks of databases, and then being able to bring that evidence together in a way that's much more compelling than any one singular investigation. Now, FDA actually provides some specific criteria by which they consider uh, an investigation to be adequate and well controlled. They, in fact, they enumerate this in their guidelines. And um, I won't belabor you with all of the, the, the details here, but one of the things that you, what you come away from when you learn about this is when you, when you read these descriptions is what they're really talking about is what is, makes good science. It's not about a randomized study or an observational study, but it's concerns about the threat to the validity of the evidence from, from issues such as investigator bias and selection bias and measurement error and confounding. And these are the fundamental issues of any study design you do, whether it be a randomized trial or an observational study. And yet, as we look at the current landscape of observational research that's being done and actively published, what you see is an awful lot of bespoke approaches to trying to address these issues with varying levels of satisfaction, either to the authors or to the readers of that scholarship. Uh, and, and yet the rules here, I think nobody would object to the fact that there is a basic idea of, of concerns of threat to validity, and there should be solutions to these problems that could be consistently applied to create uh, adequate and well-controlled investigations. And so within Odyssey, we've been trying to think about how can we create community solutions that actually can be codified as demonstrated best practices, open source software that can be applied to basically systematically address each of these issues and generate evidence that could, that could maybe stand up to the rigor of this, this assertion of adequate and well-controlled investigations. But even still, because we're doing observational research and there's lots of skeptics out there that think uh, evidence generated from electronic health record data or administrative claims data is still a problem because it's not a randomized clinical trial. The question that I'm going to center on today is, um, is how do we trust real world evidence? And I'm going to show you results of what we've done in the Odyssey community specifically to compare the evidence we've generated in real, from, from observational data with evidence that is already trusted and used to guide clinical care from randomized clinical trials. To, before I get started there, let me just provide a proviso that even if real world evidence was reliable, we wouldn't necessarily expect it to match clinical trials for lots of reasons. Sample size is different. We're talking about uh, eff effectiveness versus efficacy. We have a generalizable population, which might not be indicative of the, the subsample that was uh, randomized in any trial. But nonetheless, we can ask the question, how well does randomized, uh, how, much, how well does real world evidence match up to randomized trials and see how well we do? Now to do that, and I guess I can't see everybody. Let's see, uh, I think you all should, do you guys have like a hand hands up feature in your participant list? Yes, you do. I see that you got that. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, 
that I'm going to watch your panelist list and I want to see votes of people by raising their hands, raising their hands up and down. So I'm going to try to make this as interactive as we can do, given that we can't actually sit together in Baltimore, but we got to do this over Zoom. So I'm going to ask you the following question. Uh, I'm going to give you two effect estimates and I want to ask you to raise your hand if you believe the estimates I'm showing you agree. The first one I'm showing you here, study one colored in red, provides an effect estimate of a relative risk of one with a confidence interval that goes from 0 0.8 to 1.25. A second study is conducted uh, use, uh, on the same question, and it produces an effect estimate of a relative risk of one with a confidence interval of 0 0.8 to 1.25. So I want you to raise your hand if you believe that these two studies agree with each other. Seeing lots of hands go up. See, it's going someone down and then back up. There's 90 of you attending. 34 of you have raised your hand. I'm going to assume that there's some attrition of you that haven't yet found the hand raising button. Uh, and then some of you are actually looking at these estimates saying, I'm not so sure it might depend. Okay. All right. Well, I'm giving you estimates here that are identical numbers in terms of point estimates and confidence intervals, that there's no demonstration of an effect. Um, most people would probably think that these two values, since they're identical, are in agreement. You can lower your hands now, uh, and I'll ask you a second question. What if these were the two studies that produced? Two studies produced statistically significant increased effects with a point estimate of 1.3 and a confidence interval from 1.04 to 1.63. Do you think that these two studies are in agreement? You can raise your hand. We had about 35 hands raised last time. Let's see if we get more or less this time. Some people are wondering what's the trick question that Patrick's about is asking here. It's a good just stats 101 test really that I'm offering you here. Okay, so 26 of you have raised your hand. Some of you have, uh, um, some of you are maybe not so sure or just not raising your hand. But yeah, I would say in this particular case, two studies producing statistically significant effects of the exact same magnitude with the same variance likely are in agreement. Now, what I would like for you to do is look at this example. What if study one produces statistically significant decreased risk and study two produces a statistically significant increased risk? Would you? Conclude that these two things are in agreement. Raise your hand if you think they are in agreement and lower your hands if they are not in agreement. Hands are being lowered. There's a couple people who think these might be in agreement, but most people think that these are in disagreement, that these two studies are producing estimates, one saying that there's a decreased effect, one saying there's an increased effect, so they may not be in agreement. Well, there's a lot of scenarios. I'm showing you three very simplistic examples, but actually there's a lot of scenarios that can play out and actually do when you synthesize evidence. Um, for example, what if both estimates are statistically significant, but the estimates themselves don't line up? What if one study is significant, but the other study, uh, one study is, is not significant, one study is, but the confidence intervals are subsumed within each other? Or what if one study has less um, less variation than the other study? What if one study has a super tight confidence interval, but it's way at the far end of the, of the other uh, estimates confidence interval? And does it matter which study happened first? Does it matter whether the confidence intervals partially overlap or fully overlap? Um, what if two studies have extremely small variance, um, meaning that there's very little uncertainty, but as a result, the confidence rules don't overlap each other's point estimates. Now, I'm not just talking about statistics here. I'm also talking about clinical decision-making. When do you actually get information that you think is in agreement or concordance? And the reason I've had you go through this, this little thought experiment is if we're gonna start with the question of asking, how well does real world evidence agree with randomized clinical trials? We first actually need to start with the question of how are we gonna measure agreement? And it turns out that it's not actually so straightforward because there's lots of different ways one could conceive of this problem. There are various statistical measures one could use like a Z-test. 
Um, but there are also decision heuristics that organizations use all the time, including our colleagues at the FDA, who very oftentimes do make decisions on the basis of statistical significance. And what's fascinating is that when you read meta science papers about agreements, very oftentimes somebody has to pick a metric of agreement, then apply the metric to whatever is their experimental design, and they'll then report out the measures of agreement. Here's the interesting thing, and in all those scenarios that I just played out for you, um, that are all very plausible scenarios that could really happen in real data, those different measures of agreement, whether it be concordance tests or study one agreement or study two agreement or significance agreement or a meta-analysis variance test, those different measures of agreement will yield different results for the same exact artifacts. So lesson number one I want you to share before we even talk about if real world evidence is reliable is we need to actually come to a common vocabulary and an understanding of what it actually means to be reliable and in agreement. Because if different measures of agreement produce different results on the same set of data, then we can easily be arguing past each other uh, before we even get started. Now, the other part we have to think about in terms of agreement isn't just if one exemplar agrees, but like how often should we expect agreement to take place? So if I say I wanna make real world evidence be as reliable as randomized clinical trials, does that mean I have some expectation that 100% of the time, real world evidence should generate the exact same answer as a randomized clinical trial? Or what's that degree of tolerance that we should accept? So these are a lot of the questions that we're rolling on in our mind um, as we were thinking about this problem. And we decided to try to measure this problem by doing two things simultaneously. One, addressing the methodologic question uh, of is real world evidence reliable relative to clinical trials? And two, answering the question, can we generate new clinical insights for an existing disease area for which there is already robust randomized clinical trial evidence? And we, um, we've now done this in a couple of different disease areas, but what I'm gonna focus on today is the work we've done in hypertension. And as context for this, I'm showing you a screenshot of uh, the latest um, clinical guidelines for the American Heart Association for hypertension um, the, that were published of which in the clinical guidelines, as is the case for many different disease areas, there is classification of how guideline recommendations are made on the basis of strength of evidence. And very commonly what we see is both the, how strong do we believe in the recommendation and what is the evidence that's been used. And very often you see some sort of hierarchy, much like the AHA used for hypertension, that looks at randomized trial evidence as the highest grade of evidence, and then non-randomized observational studies um, are, are a second-class citizen, and so on and so forth, down to expert opinions being the basis of the evidence to make decisions. And when we looked across this clinical guideline, we identified several areas where the guideline provided a recommendation, some of which based on clinical trials, and it provided us a, a, a fodder to ask the question, can we generate more evidence? And for the evidence that overlaps with the existing evidence, to what extent does that agree? One area specifically we could focus on in this guideline is choice of initial therapy. So as most of you know, there are a wide range of different treatments, pharmacologic treatments for hypertension. Uh, and the, the latest clinical guidelines suggest that for initiation of antihypertensive drugs, first line agents could include thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers as four classes of drugs that could be considered. So the guideline makes a recommendation that these four classes of drugs um, uh, are to be the preferred first line therapy. And that's basically the, the extent of this initial recommendation. And when you drill down into that, what you recognize is that as they provide the listing for, there are four thiazide diuretics, 10 ACE inhibitors, eight, eight, eight angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, seven calcium channel blockers. So basically, based on all the randomized clinical trial evidence we've had, the current guidelines suggest that patients who want to initiate treatment should consider any, any of 29 different drugs across five classes. And that's to differentiate them from the 20 other, 28 other drugs in 12 other classes that are considered potential second line therapies for hypertension. 
And so just off the bat, recognize that hypertension is one of the most prevalent diseases um, in, in the world, uh, one of the most actively studied for many decades of, of evidence, one of the areas where we have the most robust randomized uh, clinical trial evidence available, and yet we're still in a position where we're making a fairly vague recommendation of how to actually initiate treatment. Now, what is that evidence that actually was the basis of that? They conducted meta-analyses of all of the existing randomized clinical trials of antihypertensive treatments. And they produced actually a very nice network meta-analysis that's depicted here in one of their figures, whereby each of these circles represents classes of drugs. The arrows represent um, the, the, the direct studies uh, randomized clinical trials that had been conducted to compare two classes of drugs. And then the effect estimates under the arrows actually represent the composite evidence learned from the randomized clinical trials. Um, and so you can see that um, across these five classes of drugs, there's arrows kind of connecting every which set of dots, which means that there are one or more clinical trials that were looking into these questions. Um, now, if we think about that, we want to recommend, we want to um, stipulate that the guidelines trying to support initial treatment for hypertension, then we could think about what our theoretical target trial would look like. And it would probably be something like the following. We'd find people not previously treated with hypertension. We would randomize them to receive one, one, uh, one or two, one of a set of alternative treatments. And for those treatments, we would conduct some sort of analysis to look for specific causal contrasts like an intent to treat effect or an on treatment effect of those alternative treatments. We would follow people for some responsible amount of follow-up time. And at that point, we'd be able to study outcomes associated with efficacy, which could be hard cardiovascular events like myocardial infarction, strike, stroke, and heart failure. Um, and we could also consider other outcomes such as safety outcomes. Now, what's fascinating here is even though that guideline is about initial, initial medication choice, and this target trial design, I think, is probably straight out of a textbook, kind of very simple to understand, what you immediately see is that none of the randomized cli clinical trials used to inform the hypertension guideline follow this target trial design. Rather, we infer that use case of initial medication based on trials that were actually designed and um, targeted either different populations or at different decision points in the trial. So we have to ask ourselves the question, are we actually trying to replicate trials as conducted or trials as desired? I'm gonna get on my soapbox one last time I hear about trials before getting onto what we've learned in real world evidence. If we look at just one uh, set of, of treatments, ACE inhibitors versus uh, thiazide diuretics, you saw from the, the, the network picture I showed before that they actually articulated three um, clinical trials that did head-to-head -head comparisons versus ACE versus ARDS. And so you could ask yourself a question, well, since we've got three, how well do those clinical trials agree with each other? And what you can see is that one of them was the all-hat trial. Many of you probably are familiar with that. That was a comparison of chlorothalidone versus lisinopril that observed no differences between those treatments. The ANBP2 clinical trial compared hydrochlorothiazide, a different thiazide diuretic, to enalapril, a different ACE inhibitor. And they observed an increased risk, uh, an increased uh, effect for a hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, and then the third study, the Phyllis trial, compared hydrochlorothiazide versus fenosopril and was a very small trial, so small that an effect estimate couldn't even be uh, generated. So to assert that we need to hit the value of a clinical trial is to assert that these trials are producing the same answers. And as we can see in this demonstration, they're not the same exposures, they're not the same comparisons, they're not the same populations, and they don't produce the same effect estimates. So maybe before we ask the question, do randomized trial, uh, does real world data produce the same answer as randomized trials? We actually need to take a look at, do randomized trials produce the same answers as randomized trials? And it turns out because the clinical guideline provided us all these trials, we could actually go look at that question. And what I'm showing you here are 15 uh, exposure outcome pairs for which there were two clinical trials for which we could 
actually answer the question, how often do randomized trials agree with each other? And just to visually depict that for you, here's your 15 estimates of studies. And so I can show you as an example, the all hat study, looking at lisinopril, chlorothalidone uh, for a heart failure, produced a relative risk of 1.19, with a confidence interval that was statistically significant, 1.01 to 1.31. But that ANBP study comparing enalapril versus hydrochlorothiazide for heart failure produced a point estimate of 0 0.85 with a confidence interval 0 0.6 to 1.2. So depending on your agreement measure, the Concord Z test would actually say that these two things sufficiently agree our other metrics of agreement would actually fail. These two clinical trials do not agree with each other. Look at another example here, all hat and IMBP. I'm just switching the outcome to stroke. In this particular context, we can see four out of our five measures of agreement pass, one of them fails because the comparison of statistical significance, we see that AMB, uh, the all hat study was significant while as the AMBP study was not. And if I look at an example here, the VALUE trial versus the VART trial, we can see that Valsartan versus amlodipine for the outcome of MI produced a statistically significant increased risk. The VART study, looking at the same exposures, produced a relative risk of two with an extremely wide confidence interval from 0.2 to, point, uh, to, point 0.2 to 22. And you can see that the, uh, our measures of agreement actually vary on the basis of this. So why am, I, why am I ranting about this? We're supposed to be talking about real world evidence. Well, it's because we actually need a benchmark of how reliable evidence is if we're gonna answer the question, how reliable is real world evidence? And when we looked at those 15 pairs across our measures of agreement, we can actually answer the question, how often do randomized trials agree with randomized trials? And if you use a statistic like the concordance Z test, we can now actually say, well, our estimate of that is we would expect to see agreement about 87% of the time. All of that's a very, very long preamble to say, how well does real world evidence compare to clinical trials? And so I'm gonna be, now that I've got a benchmark in place, I'm gonna to try, to, to try to provide you an argument that real world evidence is systematically generated, can produce evidence that's as reliable as randomized trials can, as that relates to agreement with randomized trials. But to do that, we actually need to specify a totally new way of generating observational data. And this is something in the Odyssey community we're referring to as legend, large scale evidence generation and evaluation in a network of databases. We published seri a series of papers on this over the last several years. The first one actually is a paper where we discussed how do we improve re reproducibility by doing large scale observational studies. And one of the key insights in a, in a graph that we, we displayed is we actually extracted out of the published literature all observational studies. And, we've, and we could quantify a phenomenon that is well known by many of you on this call. There is rampant publication bias. People only publish things that are statistically significant. There is rampant, um, uh, and so this plot up atop here, you're seeing that um, to orient you on the plot, x-axis is relative risk, y-axis is standard error. The dashed line would be our nominal value of uh, P less than 0.05. So dots below the, the red line are statistically significant. Dots to the right are increased risk. Dots to the left are decreased risk. This plot up here is showing you observational literature. And you are seeing that most things are significant. Most things are shifted to the right, meaning we like to report increased risks and bad things a lot more than we report decreased risks. And you can also see lots of the dots are hovering right at that dashed red line. That is p-hacking quantified. And this makes sense because individual people get an individual hypothesis, they get an individual data set, they muck with the data until they get the answer that they, they, uh, they believe is to be true, uh, and then they report it, and there's a whole bunch of filters that are going on. We asked the question, what would happen if we took humans out of the equation? If we built a machine that generated evidence consistently, reliably, reproducibly, following best practices, would it exhibit the same sorts of biases that the entire corpus of observational evidence generates that has been generated shows today? And when we did this in this initial study, uh, particularly focused on depression, we looked across a wide array of drug treatments for depression and a wide array of outcomes and we produced this plot in the bottom, which basically demonstrated that you don't see 
more dots below the, the line than you would necessarily expect. You don't see some sort of bias one direction or the other, but rather if we build an objective machine following best practices, it can generate evidence that actually con uh, conforms to our expectations about normal statistics. So this was kind of our initial foray into that. And we said, can we formalize that into a set of rules that could guide our evidence generation? And then I'll show you exactly how that played out for hypertension. So we've published this paper in Jamia that's called Principles of Legend. And I'm gonna uh, highlight what these principles are and show you them in action. The guiding principles is that rather than having one researcher with one database coming up with one question and picking whatever analysis they want to generate evidence, instead what we do is we define the set of research questions we want to answer. Uh, we define uh, the appropriate set of methods that we're gonna apply following best practices. We conduct those analyses across a network of databases consistently, and we calibrate all of our statistics using negative, negative and positive controls as a way to evaluate our measures. We do not share patient level data, but we do generate evidence at scale. So what does this mean for hypertension? Rather than asking one question like, does ACE inhibitors, is ACE inhibitors better or worse than thiazide diuretics? We're going to ask all of the research questions of every pairwise comparison of every hypertension drug versus every other hypertension regimen. We're going to look at all outcomes that might ma matter to patients. We're going to apply a consistent set of observational uh, methods following best practices. And we're going to produce all of that evidence and place it in the public domain for interpretation. So. Research questions, methods, and data. That's what it's going to take to generate a credible evidence base. To do that, I want to revisit our target trial. To design a good observational study, we should try to think about what would be a good randomized trial and then figure out what's the minimum set of compromises we have to make to produce a valid estimate. And in this particular context, we've chosen to use a comparative cohort design where the only modification to the target trial we need is that since we can't do randomization in a retrospective analysis, we're gonna use propensity score adjustment uh, as our way to minimize confounding. But other than that, we can use the same treatments, the same causal contrast, the same analysis plan, the same outcomes um, to explore our studies. Given that design, we are gonna systematically an, uh, ask questions of all possible hypertension treatments, whether it be at the ingredient level or the class level. Turns out, since there's so many different drugs and so many different classes, there's literally millions of pairwise combinations of potential treatments to consider. And even in real world data, when we look at that, there, there are over 10,000 of those comparisons that actually happen with great frequency in populations. But not all of those comparisons are valid. What I'm showing you here is the propensity score distributions for all of the treatments on the x-axis and all the treatments on the y-axis. But through this large uh, array of possible comparisons, we can actually figure out which questions are actually um, near enough to clinical equipoise that they're responsible to ask in data. We can see things like these two treatments where their propensity scores suggest that there's very little differentiating the people who receive these treatments, and therefore it could be a very valid question. We see other cases where there is some difference between hydro, uh, hydrochlorothiazide and lisinopril, but the vast majority of these patients are near clinical equipoise, and there's a substantial overlap in those patients that it makes sense to ask that question. But there are other comparisons like furosemide versus amlodipine for which the data can tell us that this is not a valid question to ask. And so even before we get started, we can actually learn from our data about what questions are appropriate or inappropriate using study diagnostics to narrow our space to what questions can be credibly answered in our data. Now, now that we've got comparisons in mind, we got to think about what outcomes. And I would assert that if I, or as, as a patient, I am interested not just in one outcome or like the primary endpoint of a clinical trial, but I'm interested in all of the potential effects, whether those be the intended benefits or the unintended uh, harms of a medicine. And here we identified 55 outcomes of interest that in, included both the potential cardiovascular benefits of hypertension treatment, as well as all of the known side effects associated with these drugs. 
So that means instead of asking one question about one exposure and one outcome, that we're now interested in studying over 160 million possible combinations of target comparator outcomes, of which over a half a million of them could be answered in our data. So for every one of those half a million questions that could be answered, we want to go through the exact same systematic process of generating evidence. We want to run study diagnostics. We want to evaluate to make sure that the study is credible, and we want to produce reliable statistical estimators. And to do that, we can't be thinking about just doing the same thing over and over again a half a million times. We have to build a machine that will follow best practices, apply those methods consistently and reproducibly, and, uh, and generate consistent sets of outputs that we can interpret. And we have to be able to do that again across some sort of common data standard because we can't be reinventing the wheel every single data source we want to go. In this particular case, we were able to conduct legend across data sets in the US and Japan and Korea. We had claims data and EHR. All of those are quite diverse in perspectives, which is why it's an, an essential that we have something like the OMOP common data model to provide a standard structure and a way to represent clinical data while fully recognizing that these are different populations, different data capture processes. So therefore we might expect to learn different things from those data sets. So you put that together for hypertension. What does that mean to apply the legend principles to hypertension? Well, it means we're gonna make over 10,000 treatment comparisons. And with 55 outcomes, it means we're gonna study over a half a million uh, research questions applied to a network of 10 different databases means we are trying to build a machine that is going to produce millions of estimates. Think about one paper you read in a journal, that's one estimate. We're trying to build a machine that's gonna write a million papers. Um, and so that's what we set, sought out to do and that's what we did. And in fact, here's a picture of 1.3 million estimates following this approach of doing large scale analytics for all of the treatment comparisons of hypertension for all of those outcomes. And what you can see in this picture is that we are free of the biases of publication bias, of p-hacking. We have a symmetric estimate, so we have, don't have any sort of selective reporting. And what we can see is that most things are not statistically significant. Most drugs don't cause most outcomes. If they did, nobody should ever take medicine. Um, but to know which outcomes are caused by treatments is important for us to be able to tease out. And if there were no effects at all by statistical chance, we would expect 5% of, of, of outcomes to produce a statistically significant effect. Here you can see 17% of these estimates were statistically significant. So it's more than none, which would be 5%, but it's a lot less than the rampant publication bias that we see in PubMed today. But is it reliable? Uh, oh, to, to, to one thing I just want to highlight, all of this evidence I'm talking to you about, all of this is following Odyssey's open science principles, it means all of this evidence is publicly available. You can go out right now to data.odyssey.org slash legend basic viewer, and you can explore each and every one of these 1.3 million estimates yourself by clicking through the website. I encourage you to have some fun with that. But still haven't answered the question, is the evidence reliable? Um, and turns out that we can take those clinical trials that had specific target comparator outcome questions and put them side by side with our real world evidence generated from legend and ask the question, uh, to what extent does the real world evidence from legend uh, produce reliable, consistent, agreeable answers with the clinical trials? And it turns out we were able to find 31 of these examples of a clinical trial uh, legend estimate pair for us to quantify agreement. And here's what that looked like. Here's our 31 uh, pairs of estimators uh, that we had. Uh, the estimates in red are the clinical trials. The estimates in blue are our legend estimates. So just to show you examples of this, if we look at that IN, uh, ANBP2 clinical trial, enalapil versus hydrochlorothiazide for the outcome of stroke, it produced an effect estimate of 1.02 with a confidence interval from 0.78 to 1.33. Our legend estimate for the same, same question produced a relative risk of 0 0.98 and a confidence interval from 0.8 to 1.2. Under all our measures of agreement, we would say that this is a agreement. Our estimate from legend uh, agreed with the clinical trial. Here's an example, the all-hat trial, lisinopril, chlorthalidone stroke produced a statistically significant effect. 
our legend estimate of lisinopril chlorothaladone stroke produced a point estimate that was nearly identical. However, we actually had less statistical power and did not have a statistically significant increased risk. Four out of our five measures of agreement said that these two things agree. But if you are basing your agreement idea on statistical significance, you'd have to say this one produced significance and this one didn't, and therefore they failed to agree. But we also see examples such as this. The value trial uh, showed valsartan and lodipine MI had an increased risk of 1.19 with a confidence interval from 1 to 1.4, whereas our legend estimate of the same study showed a point estimate of 0 0.89 with a confidence interval from 0.7 to 1.08. So in this case, all of our measures of agreement would say that these two estimates disagree. So I pull all those together, all 31 of those estimates together, what do I see together? Well, if I ask the question, how well does legend agree with randomized clinical trials? I get 87% based on our agreement statistic of the concordance z-test, 52% based on significance agreement, 68%, 74%, 81%. So what can I conclude from all of this? Well, if you ask me the question, can real world evidence Produce, uh, produce evidence reliable and consistent with the randomized clinical trials? Well, I would answer to you, real-world evidence agrees with randomized trials just as much as randomized trials agree with randomized trials. Now, that might sound like a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Maybe there's a different way to think about this. What if we could have perfect replication? What would happen in a simulated world where, given the sample size, we produced estimators of two independent trials and saw how well they agreed to each other. How, how well would things agree then? And it turns out that there's actually a maximum cap to these measures of agreement based on sample size that you can expect. The concordance z-test, you expect that actually to be 95%, that 5% of the time um, you wouldn't agree by chance. But for these other me measures of agreement that we think about in decision-making context all the time, they are heavily dependent on the sample size of your trials, such that even if you did have perfect replication, just you know, flipping coins in a perfect experiment, you know, our significance decision agreement, we'd only expect to actually agree 55% of the time. Our study one agreement would only expect to be 68% of the time. Our, our meta-analysis variance, we'd only expect to be 82% of the time. So what can I learn from this if I'm just flipping coins? Well, our, our assertion that randomized, that real world evidence needs to be reliable because it needs to always match the randomized trial is actually an unreasonable expectation. Even if we were doing perfect replication, we wouldn't expect 100% agreement. Rather, what we would expect is that hopefully we're getting close to perfect. And I would actually say that a good barometer for that would be how well do randomized trials replicate each other? And what you can see is if we follow the systematic process, we are actually able to generate evidence that is somewhere between a perfect replication and how well randomized trials agree with each other. All right, got your message, Paul, thank you. So actually, actually in the interest of this, I'm actually gonna skip over these couple points. I want to actually uh, summarize here with, I've just gone through the statistical artifacts and several of you are clinicians on the line that are um, probably wondering like, why am I just talking about all this eggheaded statistics? So let me give you three sets of lessons learned. Uh, legend evidence that we've produced is as consistent of clinical trials as clinical trials are with each other. The methodologic points that I want you to take away of this is it's unreasonable to expect agreement across any type of data. That even in hypertension, where we have the most clinical trials ever done, we could actually only find 31 examples where we could actually do this comparison. And that might not be enough to produce a precise estimate of what we need to know. But probably what's more important is if you agree with my assertion that, that we can generate evidence and it might agree with clinical trials, then what are the clinical scenarios for which real world evidence can actually fill evidence gaps and be a re reliable proxy that we could use? And I'm gonna assert that there's three categories we've been thinking a lot about where I'm quite bullish about the value of real world evidence. The first is resolving uncertainty from clinical trials um, that can potentially uncover significant differences. Even when there's a trial, a trial may be underpowered for many of the outcomes that we care about. Observational data can be orders of magnitude larger. And if the estimates are reliable, gaining statistical precision has value. 
We can also resolve uncertainty from trials that can increase our confidence in bounding effect sizes. So sometimes we have expectations such as um, in the case of ACEs versus ARBs, we don't have any a priori expectation that the effectiveness of those two treatments are different. However, the clinical trials uh, effect estimates basically say it's anywhere between a 50% increase to a 50% decrease. And if we want to actually have greater confidence that there is no difference, having more sample size can be helpful. But probably more importantly is that in hypertension, our most studied area ever, most questions are still not actually answered at all. And so real world evidence can be our tool to fill the gaps where there does not exist evidence. To, to show that very clearly, on the I'm showing you this ring of hypertension drugs. These are all the drugs that are listed in the clinical guideline. And what I'm showing you here are lines representing where there exists evidence from randomized clinical trials, meaning there is a study, at least one study, it's giving you head-to-head -head evidence of one treatment versus the other. Wherever you see a line, that's evidence. Wherever you see two dots not connected by a line, that means that is an evidence gap. What we did in legend is shown on the right-hand side. This is the evidence we were able to produce from observational data. So whether or not you think that real-world evidence uh, um, is, could replace a clinical trial, I'd say, forget about that. I'll, 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 I'll be happy to look at the randomized trial evidence that exists. But you can't argue with the fact that we're never going to get clinical trials for all of these head-to-head -head comparisons. So the only source of evidence we are going to ever have is from observational data, into which it's our responsibility as an informatics community to figure out how to make sure that the evidence is reliable and continuously generated and delivered at the point of care. So with this evidence gap, we as an Odyssey community have been, now that we've generated this massively large set of resources, now we're able to pick out the individual clinical insights we think are important. We published a paper in Lancet looking at the class-wise effects of both comparative safety and effectiveness. And particularly in this context, um, we're looking at how most patients actually start with ACE inhibitors, but uh, comparatively speaking, thiazide diuretics actually um, demonstrate a, a, a strong profile. We published a paper in JAMA Internal Medicine looking at the question of chlorothalidone versus hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 hydroxychloroquine, uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, these two thiazide diuretics for which people have opinions about their effects. There's an ongoing clinical trial, but no strong evidence um, to support the assertion. And by being able to look at that in observational data, we're filling that gap. We've published papers in hypertension, specifically looking at beta blockers, which in the uh, U.S. guidelines is not first-line therapy. In the European and Asian guidelines is first-line therapy, and we can start to provide insights there. And we can look at questions like ACEs versus ARBs and ask the question, how do they compare both in terms of safety and effectiveness? And so these individual papers represent individual insights, but it's my assertion that we shouldn't be going after the insights first. We should be going after the apparatus to generate reliable evidence make sure that the evidence is indeed reliable. And then once we prove to ourselves and to others that that evidence is reliable, then, then interpret the evidence as insights that we can gain. And what we're seeing now, actually just this week, uh, JAMA picked this up as a news article saying, choose ACE, uh, ARBs over ACEs as first line therapy, this large new evidence suggests. It's been multiple years since our studies generated, since the evidence was publicly available. Uh, we know that clinical guidelines don't change overnight. But we think that this provides a useful model to consider how organizations like Johns Hopkins and others within the audience community can like band together to tackle problems at scale that otherwise are not going to be addressed if we all go it alone as individual researchers. Um, so with that, I'm just going to uh, end by saying there's lots of ways to collaborate. Johns Hopkins is already a, a, an important and instrumental partner to our community, but I'd love to see more of you become more active uh, on this journey, and I look forward to collaborating with all of you. Uh, so with that, Paul, I'll stop and turn it back over to you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I really do feel this is, it's pretty exciting seeing some of these. Do you want to talk about your, uh, this year's uh, legend study that you're initiating? So I just illustrated this as in hypertension. We are now doing the same thing for type 2 diabetes. So we have an active work group that's focused on centered on what are the questions, particularly around you know, second line therapy for type 2 diabetes.
where the guideline basically says, once metformin doesn't work, use any of these large collection of set of treatments. We want to try to provide real world evidence to support and inform some of those decisions, particularly in subpopulations of interest. I, I love this, this slide showing the, the evidence from the RCTs on the left and the, and the legend study on the right. Um, I usually, so yes, I usually put a, a dollar in the middle of that slide and then show the dollars per you know, unit of evidence. Yes. Um, and uh, it's obviously multiple orders of magnitude. So how do you, how do you, let's take the, let's take the opposite point of view. Why bother with RCTs? So I believe that um, this shouldn't be a competition between the two. We need to think about all the different ways that we can generate evidence. And the superficial limitations of observational studies are real. In the case of hypertension, one of the things that's actually the reason why this is um, has such a, a, spa, a, a paucity of evidence is because actually most clinical trials were actually focused on the outcomes associated with blood pressure control and seeing reductions in uh, you know, systolic blood pressure as opposed to the hard outcomes of interest. And if we think about our use of administrative claims data that doesn't have any laboratory measurements or even electronic health record data where we might not have completeness of capture of something like vital signs and blood pressure. I think these are good examples where the evidence can be quite complementary. If we can learn the insights to approve a product based on a marker like blood pressure control, that's a good thing. But if we can follow it up with hard outcomes that actually matter and develop credible ways to generate it at scale, then I think that that provides a very robust complement. So, I mean, what we like about randomized control trials is that the, it is controlled data collection. Whereas with real world evidence, this is secondary data uh, driven off of clinical care processes. And so, and, and I really like that the data stays within the sites, uh, but it concerns me too, because what if, you know, when you, you're combining aggregate results from say four hospitals, what if the fourth hospital has very different standards for how they do their coding or different practices uh, in their data quality? So I'm just trying to understand how can we detect, uh, the, the, how can we make sure the evidence is reliable at the aggregated level? That's a great question, Paul. I think one of the concerns I have for our field at large is that we are asking others, decision makers, regulators, or, or clinicians to take this giant leap of faith as a trust me science. Uh, and actually, it's, a lot of people talk about that it's the power of randomization that makes a randomized clinical trial good. And I actually call, call, call bullshit on that. I actually think that the much more reasonable thing is there's a prescribed process it's extremely expensive to collect data. You only get one shot on goal and you got to share the data in the case of you know, with, the, with the regulators. So there is no trust me science, everything can be verified. And so in the, to, to your point that you're raising, if we are continuing down a path where we cannot share patient level data in the observational data domain, then it's incumbent upon us as an informatics community to figure out developing statistical proxies that can represent marginal statistics that can prove that data are reliable, that the measurement error is, is, is low, that we can overcome that error. It is not acceptable to say, well, I can't give you the data, but trust the estimate anyway. Um, I don't think anybody would trust randomized clinical trials if we treated the data in that same way. Um, so in absence of sharing data, we actually need to double down on efforts around data quality, on efforts of, uh, efforts of characterizing the populations of interest, not just the effect estimator, which is what we usually put in our clinical papers, but a whole bunch of the gory details about the provenance of how you standardize the data, the vocabulary and versioning, the data capture process, a lot of the metadata that's necessary, as well as diagnostics about the database, diagnostics about the cohorts. That needs to be part of our evidence package that builds the trust when we try to interpret these uh, effect estimates. So uh, Tony Guerrero is making an interesting another point about the value of this, what, that maybe these observational studies sh should be done before the RCT is done. Uh, and can you, can you, now clearly if it's before the drug is out to market, you can't. That's right. But um, do you wanna comment on that? I, again, go into this theme of how these things can complement each other. If you want to study 
two products that are actively used in the real world, two medical interventions that are actively used in the real world, I would assert it is irresponsible for you to start by saying, let's initiate a randomized clinical trial. You should be starting by saying, what can we learn from the real world evidence cheaply, fast, uh, appropriately? And then you might be left with questions that can only be answered by a randomized clinical trial, and that's okay. If we have data, we should be learning from data before we start the process of collecting new data. And all too often, I see people um, not taking advantage of the resources that are already available, whether that be what's already learned in the literature, what data is already available to conduct analyses. People want to generate new rather than learning from existing. Uh, and I actually think that one of the things I guess a big uh, learning for me in this overall process is we don't actually learn from our data nearly as much as we should. Whether, whether we're talking at a policy level or in this case, like driving guidelines, or whether we're actually at the point of care talking about you know, a, a clinician in Johns Hopkins treating patients, um, how often are we actually using the data resource that's on the back end to actually treat the, that individual patient? These are opportunities that just change, require a change of mindset about the value that this data is inherent to, um, rather than it being the exception to the rule. Our, our time is kind of at an end. I, I, I personally want to point out that this approach is clearly usually disruptive. It totally goes against what everybody is taught in schools of public health and kind of suggests, a, I'm going to say, a radical change in the education for, for those folks. But um, we do our little bit as we can go along because we're still trying to figure out how this works. But these are usually important uh, tools for moving forward uh, in, in research. Couldn't agree more, Held. I see this as, um, and that's why I opened this up saying that Odyssey is inventing the field of computational observational research, uh, where all of the phenotypes, the, the data characterization, the cohort definitions can be computable so that uh, when you get a paper published in, in JAMA, people can drag that paper onto your EMR and see if your patients replicate those results. And so I guess my one last quick question, Patrick, is what percentage of papers being published on observational research are, uh, are being published with computable phenotypes? That should be, a, that's for me, a big metric of this field. The, the current estimate approximates to zero. And I think if we're going to actually generate credible evidence that everybody's going to trust, we need to get that thing converging to 100%. Great. Patrick, thank you so much again. This was a great presentation, really uh, important. And it's an exciting time to be in this field to watch this evolve. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody.